welcome everyone uh, to this BCS Agile Specialist Group event, hybrid event no less. Um, it's very nice to be doing that. We've not done many in-person events this year, so it's lovely to be doing this one and we're also uh, making it available for those of you who are joining online. So thank you if you are tuning in. It's lovely to, to have everybody online, so warm welcome to those who are here, also those who are joining us via Zoom. Um, we're shortly going to introduce our speaker, uh, and we've got a really good talk lined up for you. Prior to that, we are just going to go through some formalities. As I say, we're doing this in person at the BCS premises in London. For those who are in the room, uh, usual formalities, there are no, I'm led to believe there are no fire drills planned. So if the fire alarm does go off, you have to go and say these things out the room, take a left, and it's all very well signposted. Uh, hopefully nothing of that nature will happen. Um, and we will provide catering um, after the event, so around about half past one. Uh, and again, uh, thanks for those of you joining online. Um, and we will also encourage questions. So once John's done the talk, you might take some questions along the way, I don't know. If you're joining us on Zoom, uh, feel free to drop your questions into the chat. Uh, some of our committee members, some of our team, they will pick them up from the chat and we will relay them back to our speaker uh, at the end of the session. So that's some of the sort of formalities right away. So as this is also an AGM, we do have to kind of go through the formalities um, of that. Um, we will explain some of our former roles, etc., and what we're planning to do. But as part of this process, we also do a bit of a recap on 2021-2022, which is a year we're just closing out. Um, so from our perspective as a group, uh, I think it was a good year. Um, we did a whole bunch of different events, primarily online. Uh, you might have joined some of them. We were speaking to some of our attendees today who had joined some of them earlier in the year. So just some successes and highlights for us as a group. This year, again, we, we focus primarily on um, trying to provide a service to those who are newer into the, the Agile uh, community and those who are perhaps newer to this whole paradigm, uh, and we're, we're keen to continue to do that. We put a lot of emphasis on supporting those who are earlier on in their careers. We did that through a number of webinars and panel discussions this year. We hosted a, a How to Get Started an Agile event in collaboration with our colleagues at BCS Women, uh, where I did a, a talk there. We also held, held a panel session discussion uh, in the spring of this year, where a number of us on the committee supported questions from the community, uh, and that was very well received. Uh, we also closed out the year with a session in partnership with the newly formed Neurodiversity SG, which gets very important given the, 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 the need for us to both educate ourselves and others and raise awareness of all things neurodiversity and we will hope to continue to do more of that in 2023. Um, so that's some of our highlights. We had planned to do a, a conference, as some of you might remember, because we communicated and promoted it quite a lot. In the end, we, we opted not to proceed with that for a number of different reasons, uh, but we do have that down as part of our planned activity for 2023. Again, we will look to focus on those who are newer to Agile Ways of Working and those who are newer entrants into the community. So that will be our plan. We'll continue to do other regular events online and fingers crossed we'll be doing more in person uh, next year. This feels quite nice, first one we've done in a while. First time I've actually physically been in these offices. So it's quite nice to come down for that. Flown in from Edinburgh early this morning. Um, and we're also looking to do a little bit more on trying to help curate content for you all. So we started some activity on that this year. Um, we look to really build on that next year and pull some of that together for you, make it available, help signpost useful content for those of you who again are newer entrants into, into, this, into this industry. In terms of any impediments, etc., um, we didn't think we really have any. We did start to get back to doing some in-person hybrid type stuff as well we're doing today. Um, we have seen, like many of the other SG groups, our budget um, reduced. Um, that's for, for lots of obvious reasons, um, because the BCS themselves have had to take a fresh look at um, 
the budget provision for the specialist groups. Uh, so alongside the other fellow groups, we've had to take a bit of a cut in our, our budget, but that doesn't really hinder us greatly because we'll continue to do a number of events online and it will largely use a lot of our budget to support you know, in-person events like this uh, and a conference should be do one in 2023, which is very much our ambition. Um, and alongside that, a number of our committee members have continued to, to, to talk at other events, support the community more broadly. Um, I've also helped support uh, the community group, uh, essentially in the BCS, and supported some of the new webinar, uh, new member webinars, etc. So we are contributing as a, as a group more broadly to the ambitions that BCS have. So I think that's that. Um, we also have recognition for a number of our committee members who have been volunteers for quite some years uh, through the BCS. Um, myself, Craig, Sohair, um, Ahmad, David, have all been involved for quite some time now. I've actually been with the BCS since I was a student. Um, so that's going back quite some years. Uh, so recognition for everybody who's contributed uh, over that time. Um, in terms of the budget, I talked about that earlier. Um, our treasurer, our current treasurer, is, is, is not able to be with us in person because he's, he's now based out of Finland. Um, really, we don't have a lot to report in terms of the budget because we didn't, in reality, use a lot of our budget in 2021, 2022, because we were coming back from the pandemic and we didn't do a number of, and we didn't really do any in-person events with us where a lot of our budget would go. So again, as I said earlier, we don't expect to have any real budget challenges or concerns going into 2022-2023. So I think that's that. Um, we've also had a little bit of a conversation amongst ourselves around who wishes to stay on and, and, and the makeup of our committee going into the next year. Um, so we have the four officer roles that those will be familiar with if, you, if you're familiar with the structure of the specialist groups. Um, so we have the, the, the chair's role, we have the um, treasurer's role, we also have the inclusion officer and the early career advocate. They're all the former roles that the BCS expect all SGs to have someone in those positions. Uh, I'm happy to stay on as, as, as the chair uh, and my nomination is supported by both Jose, who was the previous chair and stepping down as the treasurer, and Craig, who's standing at the door. Um, we also have our treasurer position, as I say, Jose is looking to step down from that, uh, and Ahmad will step in to, to, to take over those responsibilities. Uh, I am supporting that nomination, and that has been seconded by Jose, the outgoing chair. Outgoing treasurer, rather. Um, an inclusion officer role is currently um, filled by David Crow, who can't be here just now, but he will join us later. He's keen and happy to stay on, and his nomination is supported by Ahmad um, and by myself. And our early career advocate role is currently held by Martin. So he's just there, give everybody a wave, Martin. Um, and uh, he's also keen to stay on, and his nomination is supported by myself and Emma. And the secretary role is no longer a formal position for those of you who are familiar with the setup. Emma and I will jointly share responsibilities to fulfil any requirements from a secretary perspective. Um, I think that's that. Are there any questions before I, I move into our session for today? Any questions? No? I think anybody wishes to raise a challenge. No? Oh, good. Right, well, with that, I'm, I'm going to move to the main event. We're right on time, actually, which is perfect, because we intended to spend about 15 minutes working through. I haven't forgotten anything, Mr. Secretary, have I? If people are interested in joining the committee. Yes, also, if you would like to join our committee, uh, do please come and speak to myself or Ahmad and we'll have a conversation around what that may look like, we're always happy to, to have other people joining if you're willing to get involved, to have ideas and uh, keep to actively contribute to our ambitions in 2023. As I mentioned, in 2023, we will primarily look to uh, strengthen our role to provide early career advocacy across the community. So here's a question, a question something to add. There's also the list of the committee members to yes. be nominated and second, uh, proposed and seconded by someone. I, I don't think we need to do that for the, we only need to do that for the officer roles. 
No, no, as, as, as a block. Yes, do you, want, do you want me to list the remainder of the committee? No, no, it's not that. I mean, the rest of the committee. Oh, I see. Yes. Proposed by and seconded. That's fine. Well, I'm, I'm happy to yeah, um, propose the remainder of the committee members. Actually, just on that, um, Martin, who was previously on the Michael was previously on the committee, has stepped down, mm -hmm. uh, as has Giles, um, for, for a number of different reasons. So they will no longer be on the committee, and I think everybody else is looking to stay on. So, so here yourself. I've already mentioned Martin, Craig started it back. Uh, Andrew, yeah, good to see you, uh, and uh, Enrico, who uh, is one of our remote committee members. Where's Enrico based? In Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. So he obviously is. And he might be on the call. <laughs> he is. He's Enrico. just joined. Is he just joined? Yes. Hi, Enrique, good to see you. Uh, so, Enrique, so that's our, our, our current committee. Um, and we're all keen to continue on with our ambitions in 2023. Okay, anything else? No? Good. Ahmad, all good? Okay, right. Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Right. We're a little bit behind now, but that's fine. So, today we're putting on this event. This is our final one of the year. Uh, very pleased to be doing it. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from our guest speaker, John Cohen. John's sitting there at the back. Uh, you know, come and join me on stage in a second. I met John for the first time uh, this year at Lena Jill London in May. When was it May? May. Uh, we, were, we were both speakers. Uh, John's been in the industry for some years now. He's a he's a well a well known face and name. Um, very long uh, standing career in the industry. He likes to go as a, an agility chef, which I really like. Um, he's also uh, an executive uh, agility guide and coaches and trains uh, on a number of levels, right from flight level coaching, Kanban training through Pro Kanban. He's been a PST for quite some years now, isn't it? And a number of other things, which you'll see if you, if you take a look at the, the bio. He's also the, the creator of Complexity. Um, she's going to take us through the latest additions to that. Uh, today, and, and, and for me, the short version really is that it's a coming together of Kinevin and Kanban to support us with business agility well beyond the delivery of software. Hopefully that was a decent summary, John. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, our speaker to the stage to um, take it away. Thank you, Sir John. Uh, Uh, I want to tell you a little bit of the backstory to complexity. I was in uh, an oil company in Azerbaijan in 2019, and I was asked to, to roll out Scrum. I'm a Scrum trainer, but I like to not impose things on people and make sure it's the right thing, whatever they're doing. But uh, there was a bit of a game that I was playing with a particular team, and I kind of did a little dirty deal with them. Look, uh, I'll make it look like you're doing Scrum, but uh, you won't be doing Scrum. <laughs> and so Complexity was born. Um, it was uh, non-software, uh, engineers, uh, scientists, uh, people with PhDs, double PhDs, published journals. You know, how do you get people with so much education to be cross-functional? And it was really, really interesting. We did mobbing, which we call ensemble now, of course, but um, that was uh, where complexity was born. It was uh, to serve a need for a team that needed to look like they were doing something else. <laughs> um, so I borrowed the expression sense, make and respond. Uh, you've heard of sense and respond from John said and also from uh, Lean UX as well. Uh, uh, Joshua uh, Seidel and uh, Jeff Godelf. And uh, given that Kinevin, the sense making framework, is about uh, sense making, so why not make it sense make and respond to something and something? You know, you got inspect and adapt and scrum, and you got build, measure, run, and lean startup, so you know, something. That was, that was the twist that I went with there. Just trying to get my clicker to work here. Uh, I've got something on my screen, that's why. Let me just get that started. And we should be good to go. Um, I don't think I'll be on this top 50 list the next time, but I'll take it when I get it. <laughs> I think I was an afterthought because I wasn't even in the collage, you know, the photograph, you know, it was nowhere to be seen. I'll be very sure this guy, John Coleman, and, uh, but I was involved in Kanban Guide, 
I have a couple of podcasts as well, but I won't worry about all these details. Let's, yeah, let's get on to talking about camp complexity. So when I was working on complexity the first time, I was really inspired by uh, Conevin, the Sense Making Framework Fund, Dave Snowden, and the Conevin Company. Uh, but one thing that I struggled with for many years was explaining it. I, th I think I can explain it now in a few minutes, but even as recently as two, year, two years ago, it would have taken me 15, 20 minutes to explain the framework to people. And uh, I felt, well, I need to somehow make this more accessible without dumbing it down, like, you know, heaven forbid that I get something wrong about interpreting uh, Kinevin. <laughs> How can I simplify this? And, and Dave himself has already simplified it in a way in that the clear space where you follow recipes, basically, you just do what you need to do and complicated the kind of domain of experts, if you like, where experts get together. Once they get together, they'll figure out the first time. I use metaphors to kind of help. So uh, there's a mixture of metaphors here. You've got material, uh, so like a solid cube here, then going to more ice and then kind of more melted ice as it kind of starts dissolving into the complex space and more liquid in the complex space and then gassy in the chaotic space, but there's actually positive chaos, believe it or not. And then there's a, the negative, you know, horrible toxic gas down in the negative chaos. So that was one metaphor. And then in terms of games, tic-tac-toe, they say in the United States, we call it noughts and crosses in Ireland, where I come from. Uh, and then chess in the complicated space, uh, maybe something like poker in the, um, in the complex space. And I kind of ran out of games in the chaotic space, if you can think of one that you know. And uh, then, you know, also like the, the, the houses as well, the three little pigs, you know, the house of, the house of straw, the house of uh, sticks, the house of bricks kind of thing. Um, so since you tried to simplify this, and here in the clear space, you're following recipes and the complicated space, you're flexible on the how, you're not, you're not necessarily relying on best practice, because if you think about best practice, probably, probably about 10 years old, hopefully there's much better ideas. And, uh, Instead of using the word exact, which is a bit of a kind of a mind bending word uh, from Kenevan, how about we twist an old idea, an, an idea for fixing a different problem? How can we twist that old idea to solve the problem that's in front of us? And uh, we could do experiments and so on. And of course, in chaotic chaos, you can actually have some positive, uh, positive invention. And in fact, most of the invention happens here, either in incubators or uh, maybe Innovation Fridays, and as long as it's not managed, uh, or even hackathons. Uh, you know, what damage can be done in 24 hours? A lot of damage can be done in 24 hours, but, but it's the idea is like, let's give them a bit of space to kind of do things, and they don't have to sprint and all that kind of stuff. So this was my first attempt at trying to simplify kind of and without contaminating it or polluting it. And there's a reason for me showing you this because complexity is the combination of Kanevan and what we already have from Kanban Guide. Uh, can, with Kanban Guide, you can, it can help you to deal with complexity and I will show you how I've interpreted that. Kanban on its own, people with really good skills can navigate complexity. But what I've done is I've just tried to come up with, I tried to codify it in such a way that People who haven't been so so educated in Kenevan can still pick up something, follow some guardrails, and not kind of fall into negative chaos like we saw in the diagram earlier. Let's keep them out of those toxic gases. Well, Kanban Guide was originally created to be a minimal reference so that you could start, any organization could start with Kanban Guide. They can always upgrade later on to something a bit more complicated, a bit more uh, sophisticated, you know, Kanban method or tame flow flow system, flow consortium, you know, pick your poison. But basically you could go to whichever type of Kanban flow system you want afterwards, but at least can we agree on something minimal, very simple that Kanban might be. So I use the metaphor of a rocket. Uh, Kanban helps you to get wherever you want to go faster. And Kanban is for Kanban guide. I've got some kind of a thing on the screen I need to get rid of there. I think I just need to... Uh, get rid of these little prompts here. But in Kanban, it tries to st strike this balance between effectiveness, efficiency, and predictability. In the complex space, work is uncomparable to work we did before. So we're not so much talking about predictability in that space. 
but we are trying to be effective and when we make the work work uh, a bit more understood we can try to be more efficient to be more predictable about it kanban is very simple it's got a definition of workflow which i'm going to show you and also got three practices that i'm going to show you as well and it's got four simple metrics you can add more metrics if you want to i kind of make jokes uh, that we've got no values no principles and no ethics um, just to kind of reinforce the point that you don't actually have to have values in Kanban guide, but other approaches do add values and principles and want to have them, that's absolutely fine. But we don't expect you to have that. There are no events, there are no cadences, no roles. There's no direction, there's no time boxes. You can do them if you want to, um, but they're not expected. And signaling from the Kanban system, and also I hope the interactions you have here on your Kanban board should help you to uh, speed up the frequency of your of your feedback loops so to getting feedback from the market and so on so that's kanban guide so i have some prompt here some prompt issue again i think <clears throat> so in kanban guide we've got a thing called a definition of workflow and each kanban board needs to have a minimum of one workflow. You can have more than one workflow on your Kanban board. For example, you might have project work across the top and you might have, I don't know, support tickets at the bottom, something like that. But essentially what we, ex excuse me, what we expect as a minimum is that you define what kind of work is flowing through the system. You may be talking about stories or epics or experiments, you know, what, what are the things that are going through your board? We call them work items. They need to have potential for value and you, you kind of need to know like when does the when does the flow start and when does it finish and what are all the steps you need to go through for the work to go through and how are you going to control how much work is in the system and and also how does uh, how does work go through the system how do you manage your flow so do you have exit criteria on design for example on dev test on deployment do you have policies for how you bring work into the system if you've got too many if you've got more work items than workers, uh, which items do we work on today? Policy, you might call that a pull or a move policy, which one are we gonna work on today? You can also have a service level expectation, which I'll explain later on. There are four basic metrics in Kanban. One of them is work in progress. They're, they're basically started items that haven't finished. Uh, we just use a simple expression, cycle time. We don't want to be redefining what's in the dictionary. We understand that uh, there's lots of literature about cycle time and so on. What all we're saying is you can have, you have one started point and one finished point. You can have more than one of those. So you can, but uh, we just measure the elapsed time in between finish date minus the start date plus one where you round it up. And work item age is the uh, amount of time that the has been since the item actually started. And throughput, how many items are we delivering per day, per week, per sprint, or per whatever kind of time period you might have. In Kanban, you've got a service level expectation. You can start with a guess. You can say, well, we think 85% chance we can finish uh, a new item in 20 days or less. We have no idea, we've got no data. We're not idiots though, we don't bring in elephants. We say, well, does this feel like one of those items we can do in 20 days or less? If it's not, we need, we need to break it down. But once the data starts coming in, in this particular case here, this particular team, 85% chance based on history that a new item would take 16 days or less. But still, you look at the item, does this feel like one of those items that we can do in 16 days or less? Because we don't want to bring in elephant-sized items. But there's an expectation in Kanban Guide that you would have a service level expectation for your Kanban uh, workflow. There are some practices. Uh, we simplified the practices in Kanban guide. And the first one is defining and visualizing your workflow. Do you have a board? What's the start point? What's the finish point? All those characteristics that we saw a while ago. And focusing on those things allows you to talk about things like, for example, what active work should we focus on today? Um, how much work are we comfortable doing at the same time? Um, what's our aspiration for more predictability? Do we want our cycle times to be more predictable? Do we want our throughput to be more predictable? Uh, how do we want to visualize when work is getting old, uh, when work is getting blocked? Um, what about dependencies? Uh, how, how do we deal with those? Do we, do we just start something without aligning with the people after us? Or do we actually have some kind of a way of checking in on people before we start work? The second practice in Kanban is quite a big one. It's actively managing items in, 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 the, in progress, which essentially could be unblocking items that are blocked, 
or it could be looking at some items if you have a work at imaging chart or you have some kind of progress bar in your cars that indicates that this this item is what taking much longer than cars usually take uh, it's about unblocking items it's about uh, looking after the aging items it's about finishing items but not forgetting to feed the system as well i often talk about water pipes it's a bit of an oversimplification you've got two liters of water going out you probably need to have two liters of water coming in you've no water coming in well nothing's going to go out but you don't bring in six you know what i mean so how do we get that balance but you can also Sometimes when the system is just about to starve, that might be an opportunity to increase your throughput, actually. Because maybe if you put in three litres, maybe now it'll just get sucked in because we're so starved of, of capacity, if that makes sense. So when we actively manage work in progress, we also need to control work in progress. And so that means you might have work in progress limits, for example. A lot of teams that I work with, um, they don't even notice their work in progress limits because they're using work out, active work on imaging. They're looking at which items are oldest and they're naturally going below their limits anyhow. Uh, but for teams who are not used to looking at work out imaging, this would be a, a way of trapping that. If you had an emergency, we would prefer that you uh, breached your limit rather than increase the limit for that day because now the limit's gone up for everyone and before you know it, your limit's going to go to 23 instead of 3, right? And the third practice that a lot of people forget about is, well, we made this Kanban board, but does it make any sense anymore? Do we have the right columns? Are, these, uh, are we using swim lanes? Are we visualizing properly? What's our block policy? Is this still appropriate? Do we still want to include blocked items in our work in progress limits and so on? And so we'd expect teams to recurringly look at their workflow. But my challenge would be that if you look at the chaos report from the Standish Group, and you look at comments like for people from Marty Kagan and so on, I reckon between 60 and 90% of items that we work on, we should never actually build. There was a guy I trained three years ago, he was at one of my leadership classes, and his job was to put things into production in a telecoms company. And he made an admission in the class, he said, um, John, I take stuff out of production. I said, what? He says, I take stuff out of production. What do you mean you take stuff? Well, they're just filling my system with bugs and crap and technical debt and rubbish. And so as soon as they put something in, I, I just take it back out. He said, uh, what happens if people notice? He said, they don't notice. Oh, sorry, one, one lady noticed one day, and I, I said, sorry, and I just put it back in. Which just kind of reemphasized the point. You know, all these project managers and product managers, blah, 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 blah. we delivered on time on our budget, and we got our value, 20 million. And nobody noticed. <laughs> it's so, so what I like to do is uh, to focus a little bit more on discovery, because some of these items going through, uh, while Kanban can help you to deliver value more quickly or potential value more quickly, you might still be overfilling your system with stuff you should never put in there in the first place. So I'm a big fan of discovery. And I love the Lean UX canvas from Jeff Gollum and Joshua Seiden. A very simple eight box canvas. They start with the problem to solve. What problem are you trying to solve here? And how would you know that you're winning in box two? Who are we targeting? They use the expression proto personas. They just made up those words because they didn't want to be irritating the marketing people because they've got advertising personas. Uh, what outcomes would we be looking for for those users and customers? And it's only when they get to box five that they start talking about prototypes and potential solutions. And I might bring in Martin's activates and all that type of stuff at that point as well. And then they, they click together these assumptions from boxes two through five as hypotheses in box six. And it's like a Lego brick. The template actually puts it together. We believe that the business outcome from box two would be achieved if user from box three attains benefit from box four with feature from box five. Click Lego. And then what's the most important thing we need to learn first? Because maybe some of, the, maybe some of these assumptions are very risky. And maybe some of them are so risky that the whole venture could be uh, at risk. And so maybe we need to test that first. And so they've avoided the whole minimum viable product um, type expression. And instead, we kind of dodge that bullet and we say, what's the least amount of work we need to do to learn the next most important thing? And a lot of people think, oh, I can do this in three months. It's like, no, 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 no. What can you do in 30 minutes? Huh? Yeah, what can you do in 30? What can you learn in 30? Oh, I can make a survey. Yeah, can you really make a survey in 30 minutes? 
you, maybe you get it done in two days and maybe you send it over. You might get feedback in a week, but if you're doing well, maybe to get it in, back in a month. What can you learn in 30 minutes? And the penny drops slowly. And, oh, I can pick up the phone. Yay, bingo. You can pick up the phone. You can talk to some of these personas and find out whether they might ever want this thing. The cheapest experiment is talking to your potential customers. But of course, we have much more advanced experiments than that. And what can you do in a day? What can you do in a week? What can you do in a month? Maybe you could do some prototype. Maybe you get some feedback. And it's still, it's still not perfect. You can still get it wrong. But we're trying to increase the odds that the more uh, effort you put in, the more, the more likelihood is that you're going to get some value instead of just filling the funnel with stuff. And here's an example. If, for example, uh, I, I would like to lose weight, and I come from a place called Haddenham, which is about 50 miles from here. And imagine there was a scheme where they wanted to do, bring about an intermittent fasting as, a, as an approach for losing weight. I hear really good things about that. Now, in the young uh, lady who was into deep listening and wrote books about that, she says, you have to be very careful, John. You have to don't be looking at a problem through the aperture of the solution. So already I'm making a bit of a mistake here and I'm thinking that intermittent fasting is going to solve this problem. But what you can do is you can, you can actually, in your backlog, you can have some discovery items. Like, for example, can we do some research on, on the UK NHS in terms of how you recruit subjects and interview them? Uh, you can also uh, deliver some things, like uh, you, can, you can do some interview scripts. You can reassess some academically peer-reviewed papers on intermittent fasting. You can have a combination of discovery items, delivery items, and value validation items in your backlog. In Kanban, you don't need to have a backlog, but the point is that you don't have to stuff your input with delivery stuff that maybe we never need to do. So Kanban with Lean UX, I think the edge that you get with Kanban and Lean UX is you're discovering to potentially not deliver. Ellen Gottesina from Boston has a book called Discover to Deliver. But the real power of discovery is that when you do these experiments, that you find out, oh, we shouldn't build this. But I did an experiment with 240 students from University College London in January of this year. It was really interesting. They told us it was all going to be face to face. And then last minute, half the people went on to Zoom, and half the people were in the room, 150 people in the room about 100 and odd people on Zoom at the same time. And there were 36 teams, and they all had a job to do, which was to go to the Lean UX canvas and to talk about how can we improve hybrid learning? So how can we help a situation where a student's going to university and now they've been asked to join a Teams call? Like, what, what's that about? Like, they want to see a lecturer. Like, what's going on? Like, so we, that's what our, our problem was for the week. And some people said, they were excited, they were, oh, we're going to use Meta, we're going to have the headsets on, and people in China who can't get out of China, they're going, to, they're going to have their headsets on, we're going to go into a meeting room, it's all going to be cool, and all this kind of good stuff. And they ran, they, they did their interviews, because of COVID, they had WhatsApp calls with other groups and bubbles, bubbles of six in the room at the time, and they interviewed the other groups, and they found that no one would use Meta because the trust probably said, we're going to have with their data. I think a year later they might do that, but back then, January, they wouldn't have. And even though the evidence was compelling that they should not go ahead with this, most of them persevered. So the challenge with Kanban and Lean UX is that we don't have the step back moment to kind of go, oh, is this the right thing to go ahead with? Because people follow what I call execution bias. They keep going. We know we should either persevere if the evidence is supporting us, or pivot if we're being given some information, we should go in a different direction or just stop completely. And Lean UX should hand you humility on a plate, but it was interesting that people persevered for far too long and only two teams out of 36 collapsed and emerged into other teams. And I really commended them for their humility. That was really, really cool that they did that. So David Marquet, who also inspired uh, Complexity, uh, he's famous for the book called Turn the Ship Around, also wrote a book called Leadership as Language. And the key takeaway from his book, Leadership as Language, is that you've got the red work and the blue work. And the red work is where you do the work, and he gives examples of some captain of the ship, and he's sailing the ship, and the weather storms ahead, all sorts of things are wrong. It's obvious they should pull into the safest harbor nearby, but keeps going and people die, right? 
And the blue work is where you step back and reflect and you think, and are we going in the right direction? Is this the right problem to solve? Are we sure this is the right thing to do? And try to avoid execution bias. And to be fair to Scrum, you get that for free because you got sprint planning, you've got the sprint review, you got the retrospective. It's a moment then. Oh, are we, doing, are we doing the right thing here? So the guys who wrote the Kanban guide for Scrum teams are onto something here, but they didn't include lean UX. You have that rigor. Uh, the problem is that we, with Scrum in particular, what happens in daily scrums, and I'm a scrum trainer myself, what happens in daily scrums is people, particularly if managers or the product owner turns up, and they're not supposed to be there, by the way. It's supposed to be for the developers doing the work. They're supposed to meet together. What happens is when other people turn up, they all show how busy they are, and they talk about all the clear, simple, obvious stuff that nobody really cares about. And actually, what we should be talking about is what do we need to work on together today? Is there any block that needs some love and attention? So scrum has a bit of an issue there. It's not so much scrum, it's about how people use scrum. But they're onto something here. And actually, when you add Kanban to Scrum, it's like adding rocket fuel. It really is. It came out in uh, fair, uh, was it April 2018. And it's really, really cool. And essentially, what you get, you get the benefits of Kanban, but you've got authentic Scrum with authentic Kanban. So whatever Scrum, whatever's in the Scrum guide, you do that. And then you add Kanban guide on top, and you get both of them. Scrum Band was an attempt to move to Kanban away from Scrum in a very authentic way. The Corey Lattice, the way he wrote that. But then another author wrote another book on the same topic later and said, ah, oh, you pick a little bit of this and you pick a little bit of that. Like, so like we avoid the expression Scrum Band because of that, because nobody knows what it means anymore. And so what we say here is we say Scrum with Kanban. We don't dilute either of those. And you've got flow-based events. You can use the flow metrics to inform you. And you've got the direction for the product goal. Scrum is uncompromised, Kanban's uncompromised, and the Scrum events give you that blue work where you, you're stepping back to reflect. Maybe those 36 teams would have actually said, hmm, oh, I'm actually not sure if I should continue doing this. So we talk about Scrum with Kanban being kind of like a, a rocket that's helping you to get to the target, but what was the wrong target? So when you do Scrum with Kanban with Lean UX, the rocket might go in the right direction because maybe we're learning as we go along that actually it's the wrong thing that we're doing. And so here, what we're trying to do is we're getting the benefit of the blue work and we're increasing the frequency and so on and we're discovering to not deliver. One of the things about Scrum though, is that the maximum sprint length is 30 days. A lot of the teams that are working on non-software, their cycle is longer than 30 days. And that in original team, for example, their cycle time was four months long. I eventually got them down to less than 30 days, uh, but we started from a position where each item was taking four months. Um, so it's a really cool combination. And I was actually surprised when Scrum the Rock came out with Scrum with UX. I, I couldn't understand why didn't they go Scrum with Canva with UX? Because when you've got Scrum with UX, you've got three time horizons. You look at what, what are we thinking of doing next? What are we delivering now? And that stuff that we delivered last, did that actually work? Measure and tweak, so three time horizons. So I don't know how you could do it without Kanban. So I always do Scrum with Kanban with UX if I was to use those options. So rocket fuel, course correction and so on. But I'm getting a little bit sad about Scrum. I'm a Scrum trainer and I'm getting troubled because most people don't do Scrum well. I find it really sad, and, and it's, it's actually made worse by some frameworks that are actually making this official. There are often as many product owners there as there are flowers in a summer meadow. It's, people have completely lost the idea of the product owner owning the product, not just someone who's a representative in the local team. And so I'm kind of wondering, well, I have seen teams doing the 3Ds together, but if most teams don't even do that well, what are the chances of doing this? And this? Am I asking too much? It's really a powerful combination, but that's where the struggle is. So I came up with complexity in 2019. I refreshed it a few months ago, and it's got a cycle of sense, make, and respond. When you have a complex situation, you need trust. When you need trust, you need a team. You need a team that maybe goes through those phases where they start building up trust in each other, 
or you can use a crew. So, for example, airline pilots, they don't, they don't make, they might not even have met each other, but they've been so intensively trained, the, the trust comes with the intensity of their training. So with complexity, you can either have a team or a crew. And there is a guide, not a scrum master to be seen, not a product owner to be seen. Scrum has been destroyed by product owners and scrum masters, fake scrum masters, fake product owners. And I just don't want that. This is essentially a kind of an agile leader, if that makes sense. And uh, kind of a backstage leader. And they, they're using Kinevin as the compass to guide the team. What's the next right thing to do? We don't expect the whole team to be skilled on Kinevin, uh, but we would expect at least the guide to be skilled on the orientation. But there's an orientation reference actually in the guide. So depending where you are, what do you facilitate for, what do you optimize for, and so on. And complexity has a direction of travel. It's not fixed about the destination, but it, it does help you to evolve in the present in terms of what you're doing. I explained this already. A team does the work, uh, and it would be a small, diverse, self-managing and cross-skilled team, whereas the crew wouldn't necessarily be self-managing. Uh, they don't need to be self-managing because they just got together as, as, as a crew. But what we expect is that executives would cultivate an environment where the team or crew is ready, willing and able for the problem space, discovery, delivery and value validation. One of the criticisms that I would still have of Lean UX is that even with the business problem statement, they're treating that as golden already when actually I would be questioning, is this the right business problem statement? And what the problem space people do is they, a lot of people have misunderstand that as big design up front, but you can iteratively re-inspect are we sure this is the right problem to be working on right now? And can ever can really help you with that as well to figure that out. There's a guide, and the guide is careful to avoid too much focus on the process at the expense of value. Scrum can be criticized for that. So making sure you're focusing on the product, for example. Uh, it promotes value validation over output, and it's about stewarding teams, crews in the organization for continual improvement and resolving issues that teams and crews cannot solve. Saying you are empowered is a big lie. You're empowered until you're not empowered. I'm giving you power, like that's like command and control. Um, so it's about when teams and crews raise issues that are beyond their control or influence, as a guide, you need to be trying to resolve that or really give them the power to resolve that themselves. Don't tell them they're empowered to fix the problem when they're not empowered to fix the problem. There's a direction of travel. And in the complex space, you essentially need something that's clear to the crews and to the customers. And you focus on the short and medium term possibilities, but you can have a kind of a long term direction as well, as long as you're not fixed on the destination. And you should be reviewing that during reviews as well. And I want to talk about rhythm. One of the things that complexity introduces is rhythm. And I'm going to visualize this for you in a minute, but you, you can have too little rhythm and too much rhythm. You can deal with complexity without rhythm, but it requires a lot of discipline, a lot of discipline. So the path of least resistances have some kind of rhythm. And if you look at the simplification of the Kinevin diagram, essentially what I've done is I'm basically specifying what type of uh, what type of interaction do we recommend you have depending on the space that you're in so if you're in the clear space you just need to replenish if you're in the complicated space you need to replenish you probably need some kind of a stand-up as well uh why didn't i call it a daily because i don't know you're gonna have a daily okay uh you probably it's probably sensible to do retrospectives to how are we doing as a team reviewing the kanban flow and all that type of stuff the cycle can be a number of weeks that doesn't even not even stuck to uh, four weeks. But in the complex space, it's kind of interesting that these interactions are very similar to the Scrum events. So Scrum is kind of hitting the target in that respect in terms of having the right interactions. But as soon as you go into positive chaos, all you need is replenishment and review. And when you get down into negative chaos again, you're just about trying to figure out what the next right thing is to do. A lot of people prefer to see that on the Kinevin diagram. <laughs> Uh, they, they don't like the simplified version. They want to see, uh, the, you know, what the original Kevin is. And that's available as well. That's all available in the guide. This is an unofficial overlay. 
Uh, this is a bit of a more of an explanation. So when you're in the complex or liminal com complicated complex, uh, we recommend that you have a cycle uh, focusing on the why, the what and the how. There's a rhythm to make sure there's some rigor. So we get that, that blue work where we're reflecting. Is this the right problem to solve? Are we, should we do the right thing here? Uh, replenishment as, as needed. So no kind of planning interaction like you'd have in Scrum, I guess. Would be uh, uh, just in time. The stand-up, I hope, would be close to daily or quasi-daily, and it would be for a complicated, liminal, complicated, complex, or complex. And the liminals, in the liminals, in the complex space and positive chaos, we recommend that you have a review because when you're in the complicated space, you just need the right people to get together to review what you put together. But if it's complex, we need to raise uh, the thinking levels in terms of getting different views, different perspectives, because you need to get everybody in the room. You need some fresh thinking when you're in the complex space. Just relying on the experts alone will not be enough. In terms of the interactions, very similar to Scrum with Kanban, except in Scrum with Kanban, you'd have planning, sprint planning, of course, and you could inform your planning using uh, throughput, for example. You could use Monte Carlo. Uh, all normal flow techniques for uh, figuring out what kind of work we're going to do next. And in the stand-up, very similar to you have in the daily scrum. Uh, in Scrum at Kanban, you'd be talking about, you know, what are the blockers, what are the relatively aged items that we're, that are, we're, we're struggling with. Uh, in Scrum, you'd be worried about, you know, how are we going to live that sprint goal. In, in complexity, you'd be worried about, okay, how are we doing towards the direction of travel? In the review, uh, when, you're, when you've got your stakeholders in the room, um, I'm hoping you do what we call, what, well, what, what Michael Coosters calls uh, Steve, Steve Jobs style sprint review. So it feels really engaging. One of the things that I did with that, the people who did complexity for the first time in that oil company is we took with a pinch of salt what Scrum would say, or what Scrum used to say about how much preparation you put in for the sprint review. We used to say, well, you don't spend much more than a day getting ready, you don't, make, you don't have any big drama, people will come in and they'll see for real what's going on and, and so on. But uh, what we found was that that resulted in PowerPoint presentations with Excel spreadsheets on top and you're trying to read the text and very disengaging and uninspiring and demotivating. And so we, uh, we did an experiment and what we did was we said, I wonder what would happen if we actually sent out all that boring stuff as pre-read. I was thinking in the back of my head that I'd never read it. But they did read it. So then when we, they actually had the review, we were actually looking at the product or photographs of the product, whatever, or whatever, however close we could get to the product. And then where people were asking about expectation setting, we were using probabilistic forecasting. Um, I'm on the record quite a few times as talking about probabilistic forecasting being smoke and mirrors in the complex space because we're, we've got work that's uncomparable, we're using some data from the past to inform what might happen in the future and the new basket of work might be very different to the work we had before, but I prefer to give a regular probabilistic forecast with the qualifier, I'll give you a better forecast next week, which means I don't know, this might be wrong, I would rather do that than say I don't know. Uh, it depends on the culture. The best way would be to say, I don't know. But with probabilistic forecasting, as your work reduces its complexity, as you do more discovery, as you understand more about what you're doing the product, eventually you can start trusting your probabilistic forecast a bit more because you're moving more into the complicated space. But I do still like to use this to set expectations about when something might be done. In the retrospective, you can be looking at your blocker clustering, your blocker dynamics, you can be looking at all your flows, you can be reviewing your Kanban board, you can be thinking about you know, how are we operating, how skilled are we on Kanevin, for example, that compass that we uh, that I call Kanevin, how can we operate with that? And as a team, I worry that this is a bit controversial. The word accountability is, is controversial. But I worry sometimes when everybody in the team is responsible, it's like no one's responsible. And so what I like is that in our explicit policies, can we have somebody worried about the direction of travel and keeping that up to date and communicating that? Uh, can we have somebody worried about who's going to facilitate um, a replenishment? Who's going to facilitate the review, the retro and so on? Because we don't have a scrum master, remember? We've, we've got a guide, we've got a team. Um, 
who's going to be looking after these different events and, and who's going to be looking after the reviews of the policies and what about our team alliances and working agreements? Who's going to be worried about that? So having a policy makes your Kanban board so we're clear about, uh, about that. Otherwise, I fear we could kind of slide into a little bit of chaos. Another controversial slide. So if Kanban is trying to strike a balance between effectiveness, efficiency, and predictability, and if it's got its deficient workflow, its free practices, its four metrics, no values or principles, what complexity adds is cycles, we don't call them sprints, cycles and interactions, we don't call them events. They're not time boxed, by the way. Keep it keep snappy is what we say. And that uh, will catalyze more frequent feedback loops. And the guide, the kind of agile leader, if you like, would be cultivating the environment where agility can grow. Kaneva will be the compass that the guide will be following. Hopefully the team of the crew will be following that as well, because there's, there's an orientation reference that could get more skilled in it. And we should be iteratively revisiting the problem space and discovering to deliver much better ideas. So the metaphor here is like a heat seeking missile. We thought that was the initial target, but we've learned as we go along, we need to go in a different direction. We actually need to go about phase and really, really follow where that value is. So Kanban can help you to deliver more value. When you do discovery, you can be more heat seeking. And when you have interactions and cycles, you can step back and reflect and avoid that execution bias that David Marquet uh, worries about. Of course, if you are operating in a team these days, is anyone really operating in one team anymore in a product group? Um, so complexity uh, yeah, talks about teams of teams. There's a section the appendix A is about uh, what patterns you might want to use, for example. Flight levels is mentioned in there, for example. Less is even mentioned, even though less is designed for Scrum. Uh, if you have a team here, do you need to maybe expand your workflow downstream or, or sorry, upstream or downstream? And could you have cycle times not just within each individual boards and even different cycle times within each boards, but could you have a longer cycle time right across the entire value stream or flight route as well if you're using flight levels? You could also have a hierarchy of boards as well. And uh, flight levels in particular uh, will come, becomes very strong in this department, but you could also use portfolio Kanban. Uh, we're not uh, particular about what you use in complexity. So one thing I just want to say as an end note, a bit of, bit of a weird diagram there, but uh, being, being a bit vulnerable, <laughs> um, there's lots of recommendations in complexity. It's a document full of recommendations. There are no rules in it. No rules, no time boxes. If you're in this space, you probably need to be doing this. If you're doing this, you probably need to be worried about this. You should probably facilitate for that. You should probably optimize for that. We've had a lot of people really thinking about what you should do, depending on which domain that you're in. And in the appendix, you'll also find uh, more definitions, what we mean by words, what we mean by organizational agility, what patterns do we recommend. We even have favor, try, avoid. We do not want to be um, helping the spread of agile BS, if you know what I mean. And we also talk about projects because projects have been unloved for so long, haven't they? A lot of project managers have been told they're not really welcome to the party. There are lots of really agile project managers out there. And there are problems with projects, don't get me wrong. There are lots of challenges, particularly when there's fixed dates and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there's an article in the appendix about, OK, how complexity can help people in that space as well. They don't need to be outside the party. Let's let people in and let's make them forewarned about what some of the challenges might be. Uh, what I would say is that I've been testing this in a number of companies for the last few years, uh, fast moving consumer goods for the last uh, two years, also a travel company and an oil company. And okay, it's based on learning, uh, but please be open to the recommendations because uh, my, my goal is that you avoid going into negative chaos. I would hate for you to fall into negative chaos because you decided to basically ignore all of the recommendations. That's your choice, of course. You can, you can do that if you want to. And uh, people I want to thank, uh, we've got uh, Dave Snowden and Mary Boone, who wrote the original paper on Kinevin. Um, you've also got the EU field guide for managing complexity in a crisis, which came out during COVID. Um, David Marquet as well for his, uh, for his leadership, his language book and his thinking there. 
and lots of other people, including people in this room, uh, people who are online, who really helped in ins how to inspire the writing of the document, who also were involved in reviewing, some people were involved in reviewing the document as well. And that's it. That's complexity. We have to take your questions. Questions? I've got a question. Yes. Yeah, so I think you mentioned John Seddon at one point. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm interested in the connection um, this centre him because I've read systems thinking in the public sector. Yeah. And I found it very, very, very interesting. So yeah. I'd like to learn more about what you think about his. his yeah. Uh, the Vanguard method was uh, kind of the key foundation to this document as well. Because one of the things that a lot of companies do is they, uh, including people like myself who are involved in the UX, we're doing discovery, trying to find the next best thing and so on. Mm. But often the gold is actually inside the building. Often we're messing up how we serve our current customers. We're delivering stuff on time and on budget, but we're, we're messing up the call centers with loads of complaints from, from irate customers. So demand failure, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. the failure demand, exactly. Sorry, yeah. And so one of the behaviors that we expect the guide to encourage is not only talk to customers, but also observe the interactions with our customers. So how are our customers being treated? Uh, what's actually happening in the engagement? What are we, what are we noticing? Because, and it also depends on the company as well. Like I'd say something else is kind of controversial that I have a view that when companies outsource their call centers, it tells me they hate their customers. You know, and uh, it's just like a factory, and uh, I'll list, list out more call centers, and you know, it's like the M25. We're just going to keep adding more cars, and it's going to be great. And so, but still, I think there's value in the team observing that. The Vanguard method uh, was instrumental in that. And what needs to happen is the executives need to, to put on the uh, phone, the headsets, in the call centers, listen to calls. I feel all excited going in. I'm an agile leader today. This is great. I've been interacting with a customer. Fantastic. And then they put on their headphones and a recent cause. And after a few minutes, they're going. But what, you know, they're listening to really weird conversations with customers. Yeah. And a customer is saying, the banking app is saying, um, she doesn't know how to spell her own name. This is what we do to customers. I want me to deliver things on time. Really, really irritating our customers. So the leaders see that. And so now they, now they understand we've got this problem that we should have been in, uh, observing our customer interactions. <laughs> and then their minus ones need to listen to the calls as well, because you don't just tell people, they need to experience it for themselves. And then when the, when the mid-levels have understood it, then the developers, the people on the team, they put on the call as well, and everybody goes, yeah, this is what we're dealing with. Can we fix this, please? So Vanguard met it uh, central to that, and I was delighted to have that included in this. It's what um what other books or resources that Seddon's done? Because I think that the systems thinking in the public sector was really interesting. Yeah. It was the first book that I picked up off yeah. the shelf in the library, pretty much. So I know you've done quite a lot of other stuff. Yeah. In terms of looking at more probably more towards tech as well, what would you recommend to look at? Uh, he wrote a book as well called Beyond Command and Control. So that's good. Yeah. Um, but really, where I got gold nuggets on the Vanguard method is in the online learning that they have on their website. Oh, uh, nice. So, and it's really, it's a really low price as well. It's like, it's kind of like BBC quality kind of e-learning. It's really well done. And uh, I wish more people were using it. It's quite a good resource. Yeah. yeah actually. That's very interesting. I mean, like the whole thing like command and control versus, um, what well, the system is thinking, isn't it? And I was trying to get my head around um, the systems theory a while back. Yeah. I was interested in doing a PhD in sustainable food. I had to move into tech because, you know, economy and I'm like oh my god but there's still a very big interest to me I'm from Norwich and we're doing stuff around social economy and around trying to kind of figure out how to help people's living standards uh, when the conventional structures aren't necessarily always able to meet demand so that's why I got into this thing about systems thinking how do you meet demand and I find this very very interesting so yeah to go back to what I was saying a second ago this contrast between command and control thinking and designing systems based on demand, which is more sort of like bottom up in a sense. Yeah, and in the complexity guide, mm. I I think it's the first kind of team-based approach that's 
really talking about agile leadership and mm. what we expect of the, the, the guide is the agile leader in this case. Mm. And it specifies what we expect them to be uh, doing. Uh, cultivating an environment where agility can grow, uh, being more closer to the customer, changing, decluttering workflows, processes, and systems that are basically slowing the teams down mm. and so on. And so I'm hoping that in the guide section of complexity, that it's giving, uh, giving you a kind of a starter or giving any guide a starter in terms of what are the things you need to look for, look out for in order to be successful. Mm. Um, I believe, for example, you can you can navigate systems thinking and complexity combined. You can I think we can walk that type for because uh, I'm also informed by the less community as well. They do system modeling and stuff like that. As long as you don't use mathematics to link, you know, if this mm. goes up, that goes up, and that goes up, that goes down. As long as you don't use maths on it, I think that's a bit of a stretch. But if you use it as a kind of a social tool for how can you common understanding across uh, between us about what's going on, I think it's quite useful. We've got a question yeah. from Michael uh, yeah. online. Is discovery where you'd identify the value the stakeholders need and desired business outcomes? Yes, that's exactly what we'd be doing. Um, a lot of the time what happens is uh, teams accept that whatever is in, if they use a backlog, for example, like a Scrum as a product backlog, um, it's kind of taken as a given that these are the, the requirements a lot of the time, although a lot of people who are well educated in Scrum wouldn't be using that language, they would say made up words like desirement, you know, this is some, this, someone has expected, uh, expressed a desire, but even when we do that, we're still kind of taking it as a given, a lot of teams are just delivering that thing. And in the book called The Mom Test, which I highly recommend, M-O-M, uh, like your mother, The Mom Test, they talk about a, a company where they heard the customer complaining a lot, you know, the customer's complaining uh, about a particular thing. And so they said, okay, well, let's make them something. So they made them something. You see, it took them a few weeks, uh, nearly three months, I think, and they give the customer, and they didn't use it. So what's going on here? So, so they... They kept visiting the customer and then they kept tweaking it. And about six months later, they kind of went to the customer and said, what's going on? They're like, you were complaining about this thing. We actually gave you something to deal with it and uh, you're not using it. They said, yeah, we know. Is there something missing here? Yeah, we have a viable workaround. What? We have a viable workaround. It's a bit messy. It's a bit of a spreadsheet, whatever, but we, we, it's a viable, we can, we were complaining. Well, yeah, I know, but we have a, we have a workaround. So sometimes customers are complaining about something, but they don't actually want you to do something for it necessarily. And, and, and so what I really love about product backlog refinement and Scrum, for example, particularly when it's inspired by less, where you bring the customers and end users into product backlog refinement, what problem are you trying to solve there? Can you give me some examples? Can we talk about this? What did you actually mean? And, and treat what they're saying as a problem that might need to be solved and then try to discover uh, who, why, who, why, we got the customer in the room, who else might we want to target, what outcomes are we looking for, what are the benefits they're looking for, what might be some potential solutions for that, and then run some experiments with them and get some feedback really, really early. And often what you'll find is, I love what Rich Hodhausen says, one of my peers in Scrum the Dog, he says, a sprint review in Scrum is where the customer goes to see what she asked for, but she doesn't want. Customers struggle to articulate what they want. And if we can have frequent cycles where a customer, is this what you meant? Because you, know, you could do a paper prototype, you could do high fidelity on PowerPoint if you want to, but then, no, no, that's not what I was looking for something. Oh, okay, and mm -hmm. you haven't built the whole big thing and you found out quite cheaply, actually they wanted something completely different. If I sort of describe that my own yeah. words as trying to help make yeah. solutions, not products, would that be sensible? As long as you're not looking at the problem through the aperture of a solution. Okay. You have to be careful with that. And uh, in the discovery world, uh, product management and design communities, they talk about personas a lot. And the, the jury is still out about whether you use personas. Uh, Indy Young is saying you should use thinking styles. So I would be an example of a person who wants to lose weight and get fit. And that goes across lots of races and countries and so on. Lots of people around the world want to lose weight and get fit, don't they? And they would fit my age profile and so on. We don't need to say he's a middle middle aged white Irish guy who happens to be a Catholic who doesn't practice, doesn't go to mass anymore, and all that kind of stuff. We don't need all that detail. There's a thinking style. He needs to lose weight. He needs to get fit. And so, the the debate in the in the design communities, uh, UX and product management communities, is should you even use personas? 
um, particularly when you use um, cartoons or photographs. Mm. Uh, I've had some classes where I was embarrassed with the photographs of the, the royal white. I was like, <laughs> what are we doing? Anyway, so I've gone off topic. So, um, I'm sorry, just for the yeah. question, just to what Alex was saying there. So, so I think the thing that's key to a lot of this, and we do talk a lot of it to the industry, is a lot of the time you have some sort of idea or theory. So, so really what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to val validate some sort of hypothesis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, you've got a bunch of biases, but you don't really know whether something's true or not until you test it. Exactly. Yeah. And you make it small and tom and you test the idea mm -hmm. and you validate some sort of hypothesis and then you go on that basis. Same with built product. Yeah. Right? We can make a whole bunch of assumptions yeah. until we put something out there and test it or talk to the people who are going to use it. Yeah. We don't really know whether we're doing the right thing or not. Yeah. Couple of questions. Yes. First one is a basic question. Can we get access to these slides? Absolutely. Um, There'll be a slide share the next hour. Fantastic. Yeah. Second question is, how do you handle um, sort of discovery and getting to so that customer insight if you're in an industry where actually your access to the customer is restricted? So I work yeah. in pharmaceuticals. So there are, you know, there are barriers in place. Yeah, that. it's very tricky. I've actually given a lean UX class this week to two people from NASA and two people from the US Air Force. Okay. And one of the things that they're struggling with is uh, secrecy. So they can't get customer analytics because that'll be breaching all sorts of security and all that kind of stuff. And it's tricky. Uh, we need to do the best we can to try and reduce the distance. That was the phrase in my head, just do the best we can. I mean, I'm yeah. hints or tips beyond that. No, not really, unfortunately. Like secrecy is, um, if secrecy is a goal, um, it cuts against agility. It's it's almost like an anti driver to agility. But sometimes you need it because that's the nature of the work, and you just need to understand that it does reduce your agility when that's happening. When you do have that distance um, from them, but uh, little things you can do. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the things that I teach is if you have a scrum team, for example, and there's a UXer in the team, and uh, let's say she's really really good. Uh, but some sprints we have to we have to pivot where we we're almost doing most where we do mostly discovery in the sprint. That's going to create huge stress in the team because like one person does UX and it's mostly discovery in the sprint. How is that going to work? So you probably heard of mob programming, also known as ensemble programming. And so I like to do ensemble UX where the UX are they're all taking turns and then we put in a prototype together. Best way to learn is actually do some other someone else's work, isn't it? But even if people aren't keen to do that, you want to do that with willing volunteers, you don't want to impose that on people. <laughs> uh, but a little trick that Joshua Seiden tells a lot in his training classes is that uh, there was one developer who really wanted to have his headphones on, didn't want to talk to any customers, all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, but one day the UXer said to him, like, I need to be concert, I need to talk to Sapal today, I need to interview Sapal, I need to be engaged and really listen to what he's saying. And I'm not a touch typist, so I feel if I use my laptop, it's going to be distracting. Even if I use my pen, it'll be distracting. So would you mind uh, taking notes? Would that be okay? And the developer went and took notes. And the developer got all excited because they never realized that Sapal was using the product in that particular way. It was never designed for that way. It was designed for a different way. So our own customers, they twist the solutions we give them as well, don't they, to use them in a different way. But I don't have any magic tricks in my toolbox to deal with a situation where you have a lot of distance from the customer. I think that requires a lot of education with executives to understand the problems that that might cause because we get a broken, we get a broken telephone problem, don't we? We get uh, you know, the cartoon with the tree, we all see the swing kind of going the wrong way. Sorry, I don't have any That's magic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? questions? Yeah, there's, there's one more on live yeah. um, from Enrico. Um, a question about responsibility or accountability within teams. So you mentioned a team policy to be included in Kanban, since yeah. there are no roles or rules. Would it also mean establishing a team charter or team ground rules? Yeah, that's what I'm expecting, uh, that a team, if you have a team, uh, two common practices would be have a working agreement or maybe have a team alliance. So I see Agile, the teacher, to make a team alliance. A lot of Scrum people talk about working agreements or uh, the viral change people talk about what are their non-negotiable behaviors in our team. It's a very good practice to do something like that. So um, how do we hold each other to account? What are the golden rules in our team? Very sensible to do that. And you can review that in your retrospectives. Uh, I, think, and I think it'd be good though, if because we don't have a Scrum master in complexity, It'd be good if we had somebody who was on the hook, ideally a pair of people, so it's not just one person, maybe somebody who's on holiday, 
You know, when you get these, oh, we're not going to have a retrospective today because blah, 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 and all that. No, just keep the rhythm. Just keep, just do it, you know. And, uh, you know, if there's somebody else who's available because you have a pair, uh, then I think we're good to go. I've got one more question. Yep. So, um, minimum viable products. At yeah. one point, you sort of said dodge, dodging that bullet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I'd be interested in your opinion on this. Yeah. Uh, in terms of is it a useful concept within the context of someone who is still getting their head around concepts like product market fit and what yeah. your what your thoughts are basically? Yeah. So there is another canvas other than the Linux canvas mm. called the Lean canvas. Mm. So the Linux canvas is good at figuring out is there a product here? Is there a feature here? It depends what level of granularity you are, right? Um, the lean canvas is more about is there a business here? Can we make money out of this? Uh, right. What are the costs and all that kind of stuff? So you kind of need a bit of both for establishing product market uh, fit. Um, the problem with MVP is no matter how often I explain it or any of my respected peers would explain it, mm. it becomes the crappiest product you're going to deliver in the time and they completely forget the whole idea that it's about learning. What's the least amount of work we need to, to do to learn the next most important thing? It's not about a version one and that's it. It's, it's a lot better than that because we might have some really risky assumption. Uh, for example, when I do case studies in my Lean UX training, I remember one day um, the students in the class, they, they thought they were having a bit of fun and uh, they, they had a, a persona called John, you see, and he was Irish. I was like, oh, yeah, I don't think I have your number. So the class finished, right? So they finished the whole thing. Happened to you as well about a year ago, as well, some MBA students came to me. There was this persona called Katerina, and I asked them, I said, Did you ever recruit someone like Katerina? Like, you know, the whole these slides, she behaves like this, she does this, she has these knees and these. Do you ever actually talk to a Katerina? Uh, no. So I said to the guys, I said, you know, Don't make the same mistake as those, as those guys, you know, gals. Uh, will you interview me on Monday morning? It was a weekend class, you see. I don't do weekend class anymore, but I did that. Monday morning, they interviewed me, so they thought, oh yeah, this guy John, he drives a BMW, he drives like crazy, he's got radar gun on his uh, dashboard to pick up all the cameras and all that kind of stuff, and he's completely nuts, and you know, he's just a crazy driver. And he would definitely buy this product, you see? And said, uh, you went through a two-day class with me, and we talked about talking to the customer for like two days, and I was there right in front of you. You shouldn't do that, by the way. You should never use the persona that you know, because there's loads of biases in there and all sorts of baggage and so on. Uh, but if you do, like, it would not be useful to talk to the person. So they talked to me. And they found out they were 15 years too late. I was a BMW driver. I was a crazy driver. But I moved to England 13 years ago, and there's cameras everywhere. I can't speed anywhere. I've got a slow Land Rover Discovery. It takes about a second to move from the, from the roundabout. I have to think about when I'm going to accelerate to see if the thing will actually move in time so that I get knocked over by another vehicle. And they got it completely wrong. I would never have bought the product. So there are all these little notions in their head about all oh, these exciting people, blah, blah, blah. Talk to your customers. Find out what they actually think about this. They might want it. So, hmm. I like the idea of it's uh, not MVP, CVP, crappy as well. <laughs> yeah, I just I just ignore it. Just everybody's been trying. Loads of people have tried it in California. We've got some new one as yeah. well. It's it's going kind to of, humans. You give them any system, story points, strong yeah. whatever. We just screw it up, won't we? Well, I think <laughs> like, so. The reason why I think this is because the, thing I'm, the, the gig I'm on at the moment, we're trying to kind of. Um, like a bunch of ideas and distill them into the most. So I've done a mosque analysis and I've gone, right, what yeah. do you actually need? Yeah. And that's been quite helpful. Um, so that's, that's how I've been doing it. So what would be a better solution that's, that's kind of plugs the same? Moscow as, makes me. Like, yeah. So. <laughs> that's what you end up with all the must haves. It's just like a must pile and it's massive. Not an exciting product at all. Right. And okay. actually, a lot of those musts aren't must. Yeah, probably sixty to ninety percent of them aren't even needed. If you did some discovery, you'd find that out. So it's about discovery, really, and then okay, yeah. Now you don't discover everything. If you have loads of evidence, you should build this thing. You should just build it. Mm. But it's the stuff we're mm, not really sure that we have the evidence to ha that we can harvest this value, then you should be looking at discovery. But really, we're way over time. I think that's it. Okay?